this is me. You understand? No, I'm not a woman. No, I am not a man. I am Octavia. Only reason why they keep girls like me in the closet, I'll change everyone's way of thinking about our lifestyle. You got big time celebrities that go around in, in, in their cars picking up trans having sex with them and then getting on national TV making fun of them. Our whole world is being run by undercover that run around talking about how straight they are. People are so busy wasting their time bashing facts when they can be doing something a lot more positive. These are the people you have to worry about. The name Octavia St. Laurent has been resurfacing in the world of TikTok. You know how TikTok will rediscover an older story <laughs> and everyone starts to lose their mind like, oh, I didn't know this. And that's been in the rabbit hole of Eddie Murphy. But today we will talk about Octavia St. Laurent, whose story has a lot more to do than just the whole Eddie Murphy shade and scandal and her exposing the industry. We will get into her life, her tragic end, and of course, we're going to talk about the people that she exposed and what it meant for the community and what it means for today. So I have a very good story for you guys. So get your popcorn ready. But before we get into this first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Crane Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. Let's start first with her childhood. So she was born on March 16th, 1964 in Brooklyn, New York. And Octavia St. Laurent's life was a whirlwind of controversy talent and ambition. St. Laurent identified as a trans woman but insisted on proudly claiming absolutely when asked if she were a man, leaving many speechless. Born with an unusual hormonal imbalance that saw her producing more estrogen than typical for someone assigned male at birth, Octavia's unique biology only added to her mystique. In a 2009 interview with Peter Wallenberg, Octavia elaborated on this hormonal imbalance. She said, each human being is born with a certain amount of hormones. Every man has 30 or 40% of female hormones. The rest is male hormones. If you don't have enough testosterone, of course the female hormones are going to take over, which was my case, end quote. Growing up, Octavia found unwavering support from her parents, who accepted her identity without hesitation. My parents were amazing, Octavia said. People thought I looked like a little girl, and my mother would say, this is a boy, end quote. Octavia's dream of stardom were deeply rooted in her family history, with ties to the legendary Louis Armstrong, who was married to her grandmother and a mother who sang with Sweetheart in the Crystals, music was in her blood. I want to sing. Singing is everything to me. My uncle was Louis Armstrong. My mom used to sing with Sweetheart and the Crystals, she revealed. Aspiring not just to be famous, but to be somebody rich, Octavia modeled herself after supermodel Paulina Periskova, determined to climb the ladder of success based on her looks. Look at all these models on the wall. Every one of them are gorgeous. Every one of them are beautiful. But every one of them have their own look. This is my idol, Paulina. If that could be me, I think I would be ha the happiest person in the world just knowing that I am, that I can compare to Paulina to stand next to her and to take pictures with her. <laughs> I, I admire her, you know, the, the red hot fire of hair and the whole bit. I think if I could just be on TV or film or anything, I'd do that instead of the money. Of course, I do want the money because I want the luxury that goes with it. I want to be wealthy. If not wealthy, content, comfortable, you know? I want to be somebody. I mean, I am somebody. I just want to be a rich somebody. <laughs> I want to be a star, simple as that. I had anything to do with this. I didn't do this. It was done for me. All I did was enhance it, that's all. My father always says, if you're going to do something, do it all the way 
do it well or don't do it at all. Her journey to the top began in the vibrant New York ballroom scene in 1982, where she became a sensation, especially in the, in the face category, often strutting to Diana Ross swept away. <laughs> A central figure in the iconic 1990s documentary, Paris is Burning, Octavia captured hearts and minds, later securing a small role in the 1993 film, The Saint of Fort Washington. In 2006, she starred in Wolfgang Butch, How Do I Look, considered the spiritual sequel to Paris is Burning, under the name Heavenly Angel. Octavia St. Laurent's life was as dramatic and scandalous as any noir film she could have starred in. She faced relentless police harassment and arrests simply for wearing gender non-conforming clothing. Despite being targeted, she never wavered in her authenticity. In a candid 2009 interview, she laid bare her philosophy. I don't know if you know this, but I am very open about my genderism. I'm always willing to educate everyone who feels different and help them understand that you gotta love yourself, end quote. Octavia's identity was a defiant blend of masculinity and femininity. And I quote, I'm a very powerful man and I've always used the beauty of a woman and put them together. It's got me quite successful through the years and it also kept me alive. Basically, I love who and what I am and I wouldn't be anything else. End quote. Her unapologetic stance shocked many in the transgender community who couldn't grasp why she didn't aspire to be a traditional woman. You know, I am no woman. I don't want to be no woman. I stand up and piss in the bathroom. I don't sit down. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be a woman, just beautiful, end quote. Despite her natural femininity, Octavia credited her masculinity for her survival. It's my natural masculinity that gets me by. And people don't pay me any mind because my ways are so child pleased. People see me as, as feminine naturally. Most queens overdo trying to be a woman, end quote. Her transparency earned her respect from her community. My whole neighborhood knows that I'm a guy and they know I'm a guy from me telling them, she recounted. One time these men were in the car and they politely pulled over and asked, me excuse me we heard that you're a man are you really a man and she said absolutely when you stand up for yourself like that people respect you end quote living in a time when being openly gender non-conforming was dangerous octavia experienced the brutality firsthand when i was in connecticut i used to go and talk at colleges and i used to explain to them i came from a different time so everything was hard today living as a girl is not a big deal but then, honey, cops would arrest you just because you was a boy, end quote. Her recounts of jail time were harrowing, saying, I've been to jail a couple of times just because someone said, that's a man. They treat me like the damsel in distress at first, and then all of a sudden, when they realize I was a man, they'd come right back and say, put your hands up behind your back, you're under arrest, end quote. But I am real. I am here, and nothing can push me aside. Nothing can change what goes on in this world. This world is for me too, honey. And they have to understand that. It's reality. You understand, when I take off my clothes, there's no pads or towels falling from my hips. They are my hips. My measurements are 36, 18, 36. None of my girlfriends have my measurements. I have a right to be here just like everybody else. See, their problem is they don't want you to know about me. Because first of all, I get too many d**ks hard. Simple as that. The only reason why they keep girls like me in the closet, I'll change everyone's way of thinking about our lifestyle. Personally, I think homo are the most creative, intelligent, and the most social people out there. Yes, we make mistakes, but <laughs> they make mistakes too. This is me. You understand? No, I'm not a woman. No, I am not a man. I am Octavia. I am a girl with a little extra. I'm extremely emotional. I'm extremely sensitive. 
I love myself for what I am and who I am. I'm beautiful, I'm talented, and there's no woman out there that can stand next to me. And if they can, bring it on down. Despite Octavia saying she is a boy, she still liked to be called her and she, especially doing vols. She remained honest with people who didn't know, but she did represent herself as a woman in her professional and daily life. Women don't go out of their way because they are women. I went out my way because I wasn't, and I felt that I wanted to be the best I can be. This was not a game for me or fun. This is something that I want to live. Hopefully, God willing, by 1988, I fully hope to become a full-pledged woman of the United States. Octavia St. Laurent was renowned for her unapologetic honesty about her gender identity, and she had zero tolerance for anyone who wasn't equally upfront. So when the scandalous story of Eddie Murphy hit the airwaves, you can bet Octavia had all the juicy details. On May 2nd, 1997, four years into his marriage to Nicole Mitchell Murphy, Eddie Murphy got caught in a compromising situation that could have been ripped from a Hollywood script. At 4.45 a.m., police pulled him over in his Toyota Land Cruiser alongside Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood, a notorious spot where gay people, you know, would sell themselves. His passenger, Shalimar, a trans woman of the night, a trans lady of the night and a familiar face in Octavia's circle. Murphy then, 36 years old, he was a megastar, riding high from hits like Beverly Hills Cop and Trading Places. He wasn't arrested or charged. However, his passenger, Shalimar, described by the police as a known trans lady of the night, was picked up on an outstanding warrant. Murphy's publicist scrambled for damage control, claiming the actor was just being a good Samaritan, giving Shalimar a lift home. She asked him for a ride and Eddie did so, like he had helped people in the past, end quote. A skeptical public wasn't buying it, and SNL even aired a sketch mocking the incident with Tim Meadows playing a community service-minded Eddie. Desperate to salvage his reputation, Murphy granted an interview to People magazine with his lawyer Marty Singer, yes, the same guy who represented Bill Cosby, in tow. Murphy spun a tale of insomnia and boredom, saying he was about to buy magazines when he encountered Chalamar. I saw this Hawaiian-looking woman and said, what are you doing out here? She said, I'm working, Murphy recalled. I said, you shouldn't be doing that, soliciting. And bada bang, I'm never giving anyone a ride again, end quote. Eddie Murphy tells E.T. that his wife and children were out of town, says he wanted something to read and went to a late night newsstand. He stopped here and picked up the suspected transsexual at 4.45 in the morning. He says he thought he was aiding a distraught woman. I love my wife, and I'm not gay, and I'm not, you know, and that, that's what's weird about this, to have your sexuality question and your moral fiber question and all that when all I was doing was trying to be nice to somebody. Looks like a pretty Hawaiian girl in the corner crying. It looks like she was crying. Was, oh, Eddie Murphy, she noticed him at the light. She recognized Eddie Murphy, oh my God. Uh, uh. So I go, um, what are you doing? Why are you out here working the streets so late? She goes, oh, I'm, I'm on my way home. Can you give me a ride home? Murphy says he has often stopped to try to help pro but here is what he said in an impromptu news conference on the set of his new movie. Being a good Samaritan blew up in my face, basically. That. I'm never giving anyone a lift again. <laughs> oh, Eddie thought she looked, uh, he restless. looked uh, restless on the sidewalk. He was sidewalk. just being a good Samaritan at 4.30 in the morning in a neighborhood where people hang out. Okay. We have other news tonight. Yes, we do. Thankfully. Murphy insisted he thought Shalimar was a woman and emphasized it wasn't about seeking companionship. It wasn't like I was looking for someone. It was a person I assumed was a girl at the corner, end quote. He called the situation embarrassing, but asserted, I'm not sitting around depressed going, oh, people are going to think I'm not Eddie anymore. I'm not a man. I know I'm a man, end quote. Murphy tried to paint himself as a nocturnal philanthropist, claiming for years and years at night, I'd get in my car. I'd drive all over Manhattan. I'd give derelicts money. I'd stop and talk to homeless people. I'd go to corners where there are females, women selling themselves and give them $5,000 to $10,000 to go home and get off the streets. It's out of the goodness of my heart, end quote. But then he bizarrely undercut his charitable narrative, right? All that charity went out the window by admitting he scrubbed his car clean after Shalimar was taken away by the police. I'm obsessive compulsive with cleanliness, he said. After I got home, I wiped off the door handle and the stuff that person had touched, end quote. He called her that person. Mm. The scandal turned Murphy into a punchline and left many questioning his true motives. Meanwhile, Octavia St. Laurent, 
ever the beacon of authenticity, likely watched the drama unfold with a knowing smile, understanding all too well the perils of living life in the public eye without a mask. Eddie Murphy wasn't the only one with a story to tell. Shalimar had plenty to say too. The National Enquirer reportedly paid her $15,000 bail in exchange for an explosive tell-all. In their bombshell article titled Eddie Murphy's Secret Sex Site, Shalimar claimed she was out looking for clients when Murphy pulled up. Once in his car, she alleged that he placed $200 bills on her leg and asked if she liked to wear lingerie. When she replied yes, Murphy supposedly asked, can I see you in lingerie? Shalimar flirtatiously responded, whenever I have the time. Murphy's reply, I'll make the time. The conversation allegedly turned more explicit with Murphy asking about her sensual preferences, to which she responded, everything, end quote. The scandal exploded, prompting Murphy to sue both the National Enquirer and the Globe for $5 million each, accusing them of libel, slander, and invasion of privacy over interviews with multiple trans ladies of the night, claiming to have had sensual, intimate liaisons with the star. Murphy eventually settled with the Globe and dropped the suit against the National Enquirer, even having to pay the tabloids legal fees. Yikes. So his lawsuits went nowhere. He tried to sue them. And I guess either they had too much information that would have made suing them seem, you know, ridiculous and expose more about him. So they ended up dropping the case or he just saw it wasn't financially worth it to continue and was making it worse, putting him in the spotlight even more. I don't know. Comment below your thoughts. Murphy also targeted Shalimar's talkative cousin with a $1 million lawsuit for spilling secrets to the tabloids. Though the outcome remains unclear, surprisingly, Murphy's marriage initially weathered the storm. He told People Magazine that Nicole Murphy was shocked at first. She was like, oh, Eddie, this could get twisted in all kinds of ways, end quote. Despite the scandal, they stayed together, having five children before splitting in 2005. There were whispers that the old scandal might resurface during their divorce settlement negotiations but those rumors fizzled out and ironically Nicole later lost 10 million dollars of her divorce settlement to a con man. In the aftermath Murphy retreated from the public eye during an appearance on the Hollywood Reporters Awards Chatter podcast. He revealed that he stopped reading about himself around the time of the scandal. I haven't read a newspaper in 20 years Murphy said. I don't read stuff about me. If there's an article about me someone has to read through it before they even give it to me. I don't want to read any of that ish so I don't know what y'all think. End quote. Murphy also claimed to stay off social media and shunned modern technology, admitting he doesn't own a computer or use email. As for Shalimar, her story took a tragic turn almost exactly a year after her infamous encounter with Murphy. She was found dead on a sidewalk outside her apartment building wearing only lingerie. Shalimar reportedly fell while attempting to swing from the roof to her apartment window using a towel. That doesn't even sound right. And although police identified her as female due to her transition, conspiracy theories about her death abound, though they remain speculative. Does that story sound right? So she was trying, she locked herself out of her house accidentally. How did that happen? We don't know. And she was using a towel to try to swing from the roof into the window and fell and died. So how do they know that that's what happened to her, that she locked herself out? Who was able to say? I don't know. Before her untimely demise, Shalimar spoke candidly to the village voice, insisting she respected Murphy's privacy and hadn't profited from the scandal. She lamented that the worst part of the media frenzy was being labeled a drag queen by the press, a mislabeling that really stung her deeply. And of course, there was a lot of conspirators that stated that, mm, did Eddie Murphy have something to do with it? Who knows? Many conspiracies came out that Murphy had Shalimar ended because her death just didn't make sense. The trans community was visibly distraught and annoyed by the whole saga with Murphy, including Octavia St. Laurent, who was a little bit more popular, had more clout, and her speaking out really shocked things. Octavia St. Laurent said a lot without saying much as she fired back at Murphy that just like a boomerang, what goes around comes around. You got big time celebrities that go around in, in, in their cars picking up trans having sex with them and then getting on national TV making fun of them. Our whole world is being run by undercover f that run around talking about how straight they are. People are so busy wasting their time bashing it's when they can be doing something a lot more positive. These are the people you have to worry about. Everything you do in life is like a boomerang. When you throw it, it eventually comes back. Don't f 
with me. She stated this Boomerang comment because at the time Murphy starred in the movie Boomerang, which was a huge hit. So it's kind of like, you know, and one thing about Laurent, she knew how to throw her shade so that those who know will catch it. In a way, she was making it clear that we know who you are and we do not accept your statements that you cleaned up your car when Shalimar, you know, got out of it. And we just know, we know it's tea. St. Laurent was very vocal about how men in the industry would pay for the services of femme trans women, but in public would be so anti-LGBT. It wasn't that she was exposing these people, it was more that she wanted them to live in their truth. And it was unfortunate. Many people started calling Octavia bitter for her comments towards Eddie Murphy, started calling her bitter in general, but I don't think it was bitter. I think it was more so watching your peers or your people you know die in the worst way, get um, talked really negatively while people supported the very people that were doing the act. This reminds me of my Corinne Steffens video. I will pin that in the comments for you guys and in the end cards, in screen, all of that. Check out the Corinne Steffens, how Tyra Banks and everybody was coming after her too and ignoring <laughs> what the real culprits, the people who were sleeping with Karen Steffens was done because she was a video vixen who exposed everything. This story just kind of reminds me of it because people were calling Octavia bitter. They were attacking Shalimar, calling her, you know, a drag queen and all these very troubling names to her. And people were kind of like giving Eddie Murphy some grace. There were people that were holding his feet to the fire and to task. But for the most part, people were really dragging them. And it was like, why are you guys coming for them and not focused on the real people, the real culprits, you know, because if I was Eddie Murphy, I just wouldn't have said anything. If I was, you know, caught doing something that he knew he wasn't too proud of, I would have just not said anything, right? But to go and say, I cleaned up the car as if she was filth, it's giving what they used to do to the stars back then where they drain like um dorothy dandridge was in a hotel and they drained the, i did a video for her to check that out but they drained the hotel's pool they removed the water the white people because she got in it because they thought she was filthy and they used to do that to black stars a lot during those eras where they'd get in a pool and they'd drain the pool and give fresh water before the white people would be able to swim in it it's kind of giving that <laughs> it's kind of giving that vibes because why even give the person a ride if you're gonna go if you're obsessive compulsive but let's leave that alone and let's move on okay another thing that annoyed saint laurent um, because she was speaking out a lot she was annoyed that we'll call her bitter is that she was vocal on how hard it was for trans women at that time to progress in their careers especially in hollywood most female identifying men in that era were reduced to being private call girls for the rich or down low men most made their livings by doing you know work being ladies of the night. This unfortunately led to many of them contracting HIV. She explained in detail in her 2014 interview about her days and starring in the documentary Paris is Burning and all the friends that she lost due to the virus. Well, Paris is Burning was, believe it or not, a really bad time in my life, she said. I was an addict with substances. I was young. It was part of a history that I'm grateful I survived. Paris is Burning has become the national anthem of the gay community of my generation. It's just creeping up to this new generation now. I have children calling me saying they just saw Paris is Burning. I just wasn't in the state of mind then that I am today. I am grateful that I lived long enough to see the great changes and learn so much about myself and life around me. Paris is Burning is doing its thing in this in its world, but that's not me anymore. I don't look at it the way other people look at it. I look at it as a turning point in my life. The documentary is a constant reminder to me of how far I've come in my life and that I'm here today to still live and say I was a part of that. I took life for granted for a very long time. I'm just thankful I got a second chance. A lot of them didn't. A lot of the girls didn't live to appreciate it, end quote. The interviewer asked her, basically stated, you're one of the few people from the documentary that is still around today, that is still living. And she said, yes, basically I am one of the last. There are a few that are alive, but they weren't in the mainstream of the movie. Hundreds of people that went to the balls are basically all dead. 
Willie Ninja passed away a couple of years ago. Me and Willie grew up together. I was shocked that he died. He really allowed himself to go. We're in a time now where you don't die from that anymore. Whatever he was doing was not kosher. He was doing a lot of things he shouldn't have been doing. It took him out finally. He was a wonderful individual and a sweetheart, and I'm sorry he's gone. I've known Willie Ninja his whole life. I've known all those kids. I just got off the phone with Paris 10 minutes ago. Paris Dupree, the one the movie is based on. He's going to be 79 years old end quote. Octavia St. Laurent's journey was as tumultuous and heart-wrenching as any noir film, marked by the highs of fame and the devastating lows of illness. Sadly, her life wasn't immune to the repercussions of heavy substance use and intimate encounters with numerous men. This lifestyle ultimately led to her contracting HIV and later battling cancer. Diagnosed as HIV positive, Octavia transformed her struggle into a mission, becoming an educator to spread awareness about the illness. She candidly discussed her battles with substance use, you know, being a lady of the night, virus, and Wolfgang Butch LGBT documentary, How Do I Look? Her openness was both shocking and enlightening, revealing the raw truths of her life. In 2008, fate dealt another cruel blow when she was diagnosed with cancer. Seeking solace, she moved in with her sister and found a quiet refuge in Syracuse, New York. There, she began performing a one-person show at Spirit's Gay Bar, describing it as a tranquil place where she could find some peace amidst her struggles. March 2009, Octavia gave what would be her final interview via phone. Despite her dire circumstances, her words were filled with hope and determination, saying, my only thing is I'm not ready to die yet until I'm going to do bigger and better, okay? Paris is burning was just the first step. Honey, I've done a lot of things. I've worked with a lot of celebrities, done a couple of movies, but to me, that's nothing. I want to accomplish something that no other girl like me has ever accomplished. You get what I'm saying? And I am going to do it through music because I can sing. I always know I could do better and they're going to be like, what? <laughs> end quote. Octavia planned a triumphant return to the spotlight post-recovery saying, soon when I get back to normal, I'm going to do what I need to do. Start all over again and this time better than ever. I can't do anything right now because of the cancer. I'm just resting in Syracuse, which is a quiet place from the start. My stomach is really big from the steroids. It feels like I've got something strapped to my stomach. I feel large. My arms and legs are still slim, but my butt is real big. I got to get back to normal. I don't want to be seen by the public until then. End quote. Defiant in the face of medical prognosis, she declared, they're not giving me any time frames. I've had time frames my whole life, okay? You know how many times these doctors have been telling me I'm going to die? Child, please. I'm not going anywhere. I don't pay attention to human beings. It's God I think about. Live life, live life, and do not take anything for granted. Because what you have today can instantly be gone tomorrow and don't settle for nothing but the best, end quote. Those were her last public words. Tragically, her fighting spirit couldn't stave off the inevitable. On May 17, 2009, just a couple months later, at the age of 42, Octavia St. Laurent passed away after a long battle with cancer. She was laid to rest in a cemetery in Queens, New York. Her final interview remains a haunting echo of her ambition and resilience, a poignant farewell from a woman who dreamed of breaking barriers and achieving greatness. And this is all I have to say about this story. And like I said, I really think it's sad that... A lot of people want to call the victims bitter when they're, you know, like Corinne Seffens. <laughs> really check out that video. It just, it kind of was like, if you're going to hold people accountable, hold everyone accountable. I don't think she was bitter. I think it was kind of annoying. As you know, a lot of stars and celebrities are down low. They do what they do for whatever reason. They don't want to be public about it. Even if they catch the virus themselves, they're still not public about it. They make up a lot of things as the reason why. And I feel like the public um, is kind of okay with it. But in today's society, everybody is, if someone is still being down low in today's society, I mean, Hollywood has pretty much made it okay to be that, you know? So there's really no reason if you're still, you know, not living your truth. <laughs> I'm thinking of what's happening to Diddy right now. Many men in the NBA, NFL, whatever, they're all, you know, wearing their nail polish, carrying their bags and purses and stuff. And it's kind of like, OK, to be you now, you don't have to pretend still because I think it hurts the people that they're keeping secret and private. And it hurt women like Octavia and Shalimar. It hurt them a lot to where they were reduced to, you know, 
selling themselves and not really having a future, etc., being dragged by people, it hurt them, you know, and also it hurt the wives of the women that are with the men that are down low. It really hurts the wives because uh, many women have become sick from them living, not living in their truth or not being honest, you know? So it's just a um, tornado of hurt all around. And all these hurts could be prevented. In the words of Octavia St. Laurent, if people just was honest, just be yourself. And that's all she wanted. Like, you don't got to hurt unsuspecting women, you know, that don't know about their husband. You don't got to hurt people like Shalimar, like her life was ended. I don't care what nobody say her life was ended. That was weird. You don't got to hurt people like that. And you don't got to hurt yourself. Just be who you are. Or if you are that ashamed, then don't live that lifestyle. Don't live that lifestyle if you're that ashamed. End of story. Right? Right? What do you guys think? Am I you know, being weird, comment below. Do you agree or disagree? But check out my Corinne Stephens video. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.